Good evening, you're watching Estuary TV News. Coming up, the long drought is over for the health freaks who've endured a dry January. We play with gaming headgear made of cardboard, and I'll be talking to Samantha Tao, author of Romances. Welcome to Estuary TV News. I'm Hugh Riches. First of all, it's over to Richard Morris for the news headlines. Hello there. Ofsted say children's services in Hull need to improve in a report released today. Inspectors visited children's services in the area between November the 18th and December the 10th last year, the first time since 2011. Last time they were deemed adequate, but the inspection framework has since changed, seeing the adequate judgment replaced by requires improvement. Councillor Rosie Nicola, portfolio holder for learning skills and safeguarding children, said Hull City Council welcomes the findings and are already focused on implementing changes advised. Police are seeking information after an assault on a taxi driver on Victoria Street in Grimsby. It happened at 2.20 in the morning on Sunday. There were four passengers and the man sitting in the front seat is alleged to have punched the driver in the face before proceeding to leave the vehicle and cause damage to it by punching it. There were other people around when the vehicle stopped outside the Istanbul kebab shop. Humberside Police would like anyone with information to come forward. It may only come once a year, but the preparation for this year's Cleethorpes Carnival, due to take place on the 18th of July, are already well underway. The group met at Young Seafood headquarters in Grimsby on Monday. The carnival is in its 40th year this year, so it will be a special occasion for all involved. In recent years, there were questions about the carnival's future, which makes the 40-year milestone even more special. Leonor Pigeon, one of the Cleethorpes Carnival Committee, told us how the festival brings community spirit to the local area. I think when you look at, I mean, we've got a lot of small volunteer groups who, who throw as much as they can. and They've got no money and they don't want to be wasted money because they're volunteer groups for charities. So when they throw all they can at the carnival parade and they come in and they dance and they sing for nearly three miles through Cleethorpes and you know we, we don't know what the weather's going to be like but they go out in all weathers and they do all sorts of things and for six months they're getting themselves on the road looking for lorries, looking for scaffolding, looking for ideas and looking for costumes and money to put all that together. You know I think that's the people that they would, I would like them to come and tell you about is how much hard work those people actually do to put this, this carnival together. That's all from me and I'll be back with more news soon. If you've got any news for us, then please call us on Grimsby 31553 on Facebook or through Twitter. Bye for now. It's known across the world that the Brits love a good drink, but thousands of people across Britain have been defying their British sensibilities with a dry January. Whether it's a chance to recover from Christmas success, get fit or to raise money for charity, the campaign's really gaining steam. But can it change the alcohol culture in this country, which is the ambitious aim of Alcohol Concern, which coordinates the campaign every year? Here with more is someone who knows plenty about it, reporter James Dunn. If you're anything like me, you've been avoiding places like these for the last month. It's a quest that's been heavily backed by celebrities, politicians and health bosses alike. I think it's the, that they saw an opportunity to highlight the issues of alcohol uh, being the, the new year and people were making resolutions and, and that's the sort of thing people do and I think that uh, has highlighted the issue for them. I think the, the general message is that the principle of Dry January is that that gets applied uh, on a regular basis, uh, every week. There are noticeable benefits. I've got a bit more done and I've thrown myself into exercise. 10k on a Saturday morning is a lot less daunting without the hangover. But here in Britain, alcohol consumption is a public problem. Every weekend, police forces, hospitals and councils see the impact of Britain's drinking culture on both people and the public purse. And while Brits have been drinkers for centuries, many believe it's been exacerbated by 24-hour drinking laws. I think it's, it's developed. I mean, we've always had a, a drinking culture, but we're drinking far more than, than we did uh, 30 years ago. We're drinking slightly less than we were five years ago, but I think it's that whole uh, issue around the 24-hour uh, economy and, and probably our approach has not been... Uh, as quite as civilised as, as our European partners and that's caused a problem in terms of access to alcohol um, and that needs to be uh, reviewed probably in terms of, of how we approach particularly the nighttime economy. 
for most of us, giving up booze for good isn't really realistic. But Mr Pintus says just abstaining for two days a week will give our livers the chance they need to recover. So if Dry January's taught me one useful thing, it's that a night out in the boozer without the booze isn't such a bad thing. Cheers, James. You're watching SGTV News. A little later, we catch up on events in Beverly, and Dan Kemp will bring you all the sports news. Samantha Towle has written seven books, all tales of love and romance, as indicated by titles like The Mighty Storm, The Weathering, uh, Weathering the Storm, and Taming the Storm. A little bit of a series there, Sam. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, tell me, uh, how romantic are these novels of yours? I'm fairly romantic, yes. Uh, are they, <laughs> they, are they, uh, there's going to be some uh, where in the, uh, on the spectrum between uh, uh, E.L. James and Barbara Cartland. Um, probably a little bit higher, close to the E.L. James. <laughs> okay, so they're, they're, they're quite, I mean, they're quite raunchy. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, you've written seven of them, mm -hmm. and you write fast. Uh, yeah, fairly fast, yeah. How did you get into this writing? Um, well, I'd like to write since I was small, but it was one of those things that kind of um, tailed off. And then, um, obviously, as I got older, I was wanting to do it, but I was trying, it wasn't working. And then I was um, on maternity leave with my son, my first child, and I had a whole year and a great sleeping baby. Um, so my husband encouraged me to, to write a book, and I did. Uh, that was it. And that, that first one, what was that called? Um, that's actually an untitled novel that I never had published. Right. Um, and then I wrote the next one, and it, it went on from there. Well, so. you've got these titles. I mean, the, 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 mm. the, the Storm trilogy yes. is, uh, um, is, is clearly a great success. Mm -hmm. I can't hold three books in my hands <laughs> at once, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, and you've, you've how, many, how many books have you sold in total, do you think? Um, I, th I think probably around the half a million mark and, and growing, yeah. Uh, that's a fantastic uh, audience. Any writer yes. would dream of that. Yes, uh, you've uh, and you were published in several languages as well. If I, I, I th there's you know, trouble, which looks like a, a a good read. German is just a matter of poor spelling, isn't it? Uh, really? That one's actually the Czech. That's Czech. That's the it? Czech one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right but so. I I published and um, we have different novels. I have the Mighty Storm in Germany and Weather in the Storm will also come out in Germany too. And we've just signed with Italy and Russia, I believe. I think there might be. A few other places I can't remember, but uh, yes, it's uh, great. Uh, but you're big in America. Yeah, it's predominantly where my books sold. Um, it's picking the market is is picking up here. I'm getting more recognition here now um, than I used to. But when the Mighty Storm, which was the first book for me that kind of really exploded, that was more in the U.S. Uh, well, you've got uh, a Wall Street Journal bestseller, New York Times bestselling author. Yeah, yeah, I got all three, which was kind of good. I got the U.S. Today, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. So that was kind of what you dream of getting. So that was that was amazing when I got that. Uh, one of the, I can't remember who it was who said that the, 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 the worst thing about being a writer is all the paperwork. Uh, I suppose <laughs> that, I suppose that's <laughs> no longer true with computers, is it? Uh, but yeah. so take me, th what, what do you do all day? I mean, if I, if I earn my living by writing novels, all I do is drink tea and look out the window. I, I just, I, well, at the moment, I'm up at about five o'clock every morning um, because it's kind of a good window before the children get off at school. Um, and I go down and start writing, but I have a lot of social media, so I get messages and emails and things that I have to reply to as well. Uh, when I first started writing, I just thought you wrote a book and then that was it. But there's a lot of other things that go with it as well that you don't even kind of take into account. Uh, and so that's all your marketing effectively, as well yes. as creating the product, writing yeah, the book, you have it. to sell it as well. Yes. And that's because of uh, uh, technology that mm. your readers can get directly in contact with you. Yeah, it's good. Years ago, we couldn't speak to authors unless we wrote them a letter and prayed for a reply back. But now we're easily accessible. You know, we can, you know, readers can contact us on Facebook, um, ask us a message if they have a burning question about something they want to know about the book and it's not in there, they can get in touch and, and respond. And of course, there's still the traditional book signing. Do you go around the country uh, sitting there in bookshops and shaking hands? Um, yeah, I haven't actually, strangely, I haven't done a bookstore signing. There are um, organised signing events that I go to. So I did one last year in New York, which was pretty cool. Um, but I've done them in London. And uh, this year I've got five. I've got Dublin and Aberdeen, one in York, actually, um, coming up, um, Peterborough. Oh. You have, you yeah. clearly have legions of devoted fans. Yes. <laughs> uh, the books, that, who publishes? Um, well, I self-publish them, um, and I also, with The Mighty Storm and Weather in the Storm, they're published with um, Montlake, which is a division of Amazon Publishing. 
So um, what they call a hybrid author. So I hybrid. Yeah, hybrid. I traditionally publish and self-publish, so they call us hybrids. Uh, okay, but <laughs> also, also hybrid in that you uh, publish on traditional ink and paper a la William Caxton, uh, but you also, uh, you're also available through Kindle. Yeah, most of book sales nowadays are through Kindle um, and Nook and well, iBooks and, and everything, yeah, so predominantly that's the, the biggest seller. What's the attraction of this romance? I have to confess, I don't, <laughs> I'm not aware that I've ever read a romance novel, I'm afraid, unless I know J um, Jane Austen or something like that just about counts, doesn't it? But uh, what's the attraction mm. of these romances? Who well, reads them? Um, people like me, I think, and I, I know for myself, predominantly, because even though I write books, I still like to read them. It's nice, um, it's an escape from your everyday life, so you can step out of your own life and step into someone else's and all these wonderful, exciting things, like with The Mighty Storm, it's based around a rock band. I'm never going to experience being around a rock band, so I you know, get to read about it instead. Well, why can't you just write to a rock band <laughs> and say, can I, can I, can I well, spend a day with you? I could try. It'd be, yeah, it'd be nice, but I don't know if that'll happen. It's a strange question, isn't it? Because, mm. I mean, presumably, with if your genre is uh, romantic writing, is, mm -hmm. is, is romance, yeah. then at any other writer, you'd say, well, you've got to go and do your research. You know, if you're writing about history, go to a battlefield. If you're yeah. writing about uh, uh, spying, speak to a spy. Yeah. If you're writing about romance, I suppose you just have to, what, you just have to f find somebody <laughs> you really like. <laughs> well, fortunately, I'm married. This is what I really like. But um, it's, it's all in the imagination, and I think it's kind of stepping outside of the box as well. Um, and when, when I write my books, I try and think of the the most romantic scenario or even a little step beyond that, you know, and just take it to that sort of limit. Uh, what have you got on the blocks at the moment? What's the title of your next one going to be? It's called Revved. Revved? Yes. As in, yes. As in a Church of England clergyman? No, as, <laughs> as in a revving car. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, good luck with that. I hope Thank you enjoy you. writing it as much as people enjoy reading it. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Virtual reality is often consigned to the movies, films such as Tron and The Matrix, but now a team of graduates from our area is aiming to make it accessible uh, to all for the price of a DVD. Dan Kemp went to meet them and see why they're focusing on the future of gaming. Priced in the hundreds of pounds, the Oculus Rift is the market leader in the virtual reality world. But now it's hoped the cheaper end of the market will be filled by a team of designers from Hull who have designed a headset they're hoping to sell for just £15. It's really good, because um, not many people expect stuff to come out of all, really. And it's sort of pioneering the technology in this area. The visor works by inserting your smartphone into the slot at the top of the cardboard viewer, and lenses within it focus your eyes on the smartphone screen. The team hope that it's simple and effective enough to encourage people to pick up and play with their devices, especially for those who are new to virtual reality. If we want more people to get into the VR space, then you're going to need to have a cheaper product. Uh, like I was saying, the Oculus is like, uh, very expensive. If you've got something that's £15, that's almost like disposable in a sense, I guess. You can, if something happens to this, you, you know, £15 isn't much to spend on another, uh, another model. And it's hoped that the limits of the technology go well beyond gaming. But also, in education, in even in business, you can have uh, virtual reality training things. So, like if there's a dangerous environment that you wouldn't normally be allowed to go in, but you still need to train for health and safety or whatever, you can just do it virtually. Or in education, if a teacher is telling, teaching you about ancient Rome or something, you can actually go there and visit it. But for now, the team are concentrating on games and have developed some demos to showcase the technology. The project is on the crowdfunding site Kickstarter for three more days as they look for £25,000 to fund the project. Now for big questions to little kids. This week we get the answers from Canon Peter Hall Primary School. that trees are more important. And why are trees more important? Because they give oxygen so we stay alive. What I think is should be prioritised first is transport, but let's not get carried away, because if we get carried away with roads and train tracks, there'll be 
too much of that and then we'll have no trees left. The trains. Because cars produce more pollution which makes our ozone layer and causes global warming. And global warming is bad. And technically, we need to stop cars and more trains. Because more trains these days are more electrical and it's the best way of transport. I think we should prioritise the trees because um, in forests, millions of trees are getting cut down and it's endangering animals. And trees, like other people said, trees give oxygen for us to live and bring in carbon dioxide. Time now to check the schedule in one of our communities. We ask David Elvidge of Beverly Town Council what's going on. Hello, David. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. First of all, for the sake of our viewers who may not live nearby, please tell me um, where are you from and where is it exactly? I am from Beverly in the East Riding of Yorkshire, which is the county town, we're very proud to say. It's a lovely place. I was born here and I've lived here the, the start of my life, hope to end my life here. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, tell me a little bit about what's going on in Beverly at the moment. Um, Beverly is um, blessed as a, a small market town, which is um, growing a bit too rapidly for some people. But it's, it's, it's still attracting um, all sorts of different things. It's difficult to say, but when I look back over the years, Beverly had one or two restaurants, a few cafes. It now seems to cater for the whole of the country with every conceivable type of food, every sort of cafe. Um, we are blessed, as always, by about 40 public houses, which is quite a lot for a, a market town. And as for things going on, everything seems to be happening at once in Beverly. So um, what, what particular from, issues sorry. are we looking at at the moment? Is there anything concerning or, or that people are happy about in Beverly at the moment? I think, I think people are concerned about the rapid expansion of the town. And there's also a, a nationwide thing where the government are pushing for um, creating jobs by building. So... It's, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, we all want to create jobs. But do we really want to build? Well, sadly, we have to. We're expanding population. We seem to be an attractive place to live. But that's the double-edged sword that you have to attract people to you. And then I've just stood actually near a, a development called Fleming Gate, where Beverly's going to have for the first time in a number of years its own cinema. And it's attracted an 80-bedroom Premier Inn, which is quite you know, good for the town. Well, that does sound like positive news. Um, when you talk about building developments and you're attracting people, I mean, what do you think about young people, for example? Because there are always some people who don't like the idea of new houses popping up, but then there will be no doubt some people looking to get on the property ladder who quite like the idea of new houses in the area. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing to um, get the affordable housing for young people now. Certain um, people in certain jobs just cannot raise the funds to get on the property ladder. So I'm very glad that the government at the moment are offering sorts of, all sorts of different incentives to help them get onto the property ladder. I, my son's in his early 20s, and for him to start off to buy a house is going to be quite difficult. And what about events? Is there anything uh, interesting happening in Beverly in the upcoming months? There's always something happening in Beverly. There are uh, the Minster hosts various concerts. We are blessed now. We have the East Riding Theatre, which has just opened here. Um, the, light, the leading light there is Vincent Regan, that uh, people will recognise from films like The 300 and Troy. So he's gone from Hollywood to doing spooks and various things on TV. Um, he's now back in the theatre in Little Old Beverly, which is quite good for us. That sounds fantastic. And what's coming up in the theatre at the moment? Any particular productions worth looking for? Well, I've just seen an advert for one, which is um, everything about Downton, where they're looking at um, the sort of Edwardian thing, where the big house with the servants and everything. I think that's very much an appealing thing for people now. So there's a short play on that theme. Now, the town council at the moment, they've always discussing uh, interesting things, things that worry, things that people are happy about within the town. Uh, tell me what's big on the agenda in the chamber at the moment. Big on the agenda, as always, is food in Beverly. We seem to have a, an obsession with food, but it's, to us it's a healthy thing because we're looking at food and it's linked to local food that were really imp important to us. Uh, farmers markets, things like that. So the latest initiative is to look at, um, bizarrely enough, we have a Saturday market and a Wednesday market. 
the, the Wednesday market has uh, died off over the years. So we're looking at how we can build on the Wednesday market and sort of revive it a little bit, bring it a bit more back to life, and at the same time support local food producers. Well, Dave, thank you very much for telling me what's going on in Beverly at the moment, and uh, we'll speak to you next time, no doubt. OK, great. Thanks for that. Now it's over to Dan Kemp for the sport. The transfer deadline has now passed and both Hull City and Scunthorpe United got deals over the line yesterday. The Tigers left it until gone midnight to finally confirm the signing of Senegalese international forward Dame Ndoy. The locomotive Moscow man has signed a two and a half year deal at the KC Stadium after the club had to apply for more time from the Premier League to get their man. Meanwhile, the Iron have let striker Lyle Taylor join Partick Thistle on loan until the end of the current campaign, and defender David Murfin has joined the Football League's bottom club Hartlepool United for a month. In terms of incomings, United have agreed terms with Leicester City to allow striker Tom Hopper to remain with the club until the end of the season. In Rugby Union, Hull Ionian suffered a disappointing 38 points to 5 defeat against Sedgley Park in National League 2 North. Eyes have been dislodged at the top of the division by Amptill and District after only managing a final minute Steve Slingsby try. Elsewhere, Hull IUFC remained 14th out of 16 after losing 31-15 at home to Huddersfield and in Midlands 3, Scunthorpe beat Nuneaton 15-6. Hull FC have announced the passing of former record signing Terry Hollindrake at the age of 80. He joined the Black and Whites in 1960 for £6,000 and made 114 appearances for the side. And don't forget, Grimsby Town match with Dover Athletic was postponed tonight due to the weather, but North Ferriby United are still in action. They're at Oxford City in the Vanarama Conference North tonight. Kick-off is 7.45. The Villagers are four points from the final playoff place, while the Seedings opponents sit one point further back. And that's all for the sport. Thanks very much, Dan. That's all we have time for for today's programme. If you have a story for us, please go to Facebook or Twitter pages. Details here are on the screen. Email news at estuary.tv or telephone Grimsby 315561. Until tomorrow, good evening. Hello and welcome to Estuary TV's weather. Early ice stretches on untreated services for Wednesday, sunny or bright intervals and snow showers, some heavy and a maximum temperature of 3 degrees. Thursday will be cold with widespread frost and ice, further snow showers are expected.